I'd like to welcome everybody to our second Ed Chat of Ed Chat Interactive of 2017, Girls and Boys in STEM, with uh, my friend Sylvia Martinez. And uh, we'll be getting started in, well, we're getting started now. Uh, just give you a, a quick intro. Uh, Ed Chat Interactive, you're all here. Many of you have been here before, but our purpose is to allow you to have an interactive experience when doing online professional view um, if you have microphones and headsets that you come up and talk with uh, Sylvia and or and or me when we ask you to um, and um, hopefully you can all still hear me because um, <clears throat> I just got an error message on my computer but uh, let me explain a little bit about um, about about the platform that we're going to be using, Shindig. Uh, you all see the hand button and the ask button. You all clicked the hand button earlier. Uh, indicate that you could hear me. Uh, the ask button allows you to ask a question, and then I can pass the question on to Sylvia. So if you have questions, click on the ask button. It'll ask me the question, and I'll pass that on to, to Sylvia. Uh, a, another way of interacting is through the back channel IM. If you move your cursors over your avatar, uh, you'll see that there's a five-item menu there, one of which is IM. If you click on IM, that will allow you to interact with the other people in the room. So I'd like you to do that and um, maybe provide one example um, that where you've seen boys, so please uh, that I am button, and I'm assuming that you can still hear me because uh, I keep on getting an error message somehow or other. And then um, the final way of interacting with uh, with within Shindig is to do a video chat with the other participants. Uh, because we're getting started a little bit late, I'm not going to do the intro activity here. I'm going to bring uh, Sylvia up in a, in a second. But uh, if you click on the avatar of another person here, you can have a video chat with them. And we're going to have you try that a, a few times during the session. I will say I do notice that one of you is using a tablet. You cannot do those things on a tablet. However, you can ask me a question. So if you want to interact with anybody else and you're using a tablet, click on the Ask button. That will set a question to me, and I can direct to other people. Uh, Sylvia is being brought to us uh, by virtue of FETC. Sylvia is going to be down in FETC a week after next. Uh, she's going to be uh, doing a few different sessions at, at FETC. And uh, if you haven't been to FETC, it is really the winter ed tech conference, um, and you should consider going. Orlando is a great place to be during the winter, and FETC is a great conference to go to. And if you use the code EDCHAT11 when you register, uh, you'll get a $30 reduction in, in the fees. Uh, I will say um, Sylvia is going to be back on February 9th uh, for how do you teach the E in STEM since engineering isn't in the, uh, in the, in the basic curriculum. Uh, the question is, well, where, where are you going to find time? Well. Um, you know, you can you can you can teach engineering in a number of different ways through for almost any topic, and Sylvia is going to go into ways you can do that. And before then, next week, uh, the week before FETC, we're going to have Rush and Hurley talk about make your school something special. So that was the uh, the really of um, an intro of Ed Chat. Um, let me bring Sylvia up now. Okay, Sylvia, can you still hear Hello. me? Hello. Ah, good. I hear you. Okay. Okay. So, um, welcome to EdChat Interactive. And um, I, I guess, uh, you know, something since the topic is girls and boys in STEM, I'm going to just use this as just a little bit of an opportunity to brag uh, because I have a daughter who graduated magna cum laude from Carnegie Mellon as a mechanical engineer and just got her master's in materials and, and um, mechanical engineering from University of Maryland without a single B. So I will say that it, it, 
Um, there are girls in STEM, and I know that you, um, as an engineer, so you're a STEM person yourself. That's right. And so let me allow you that's to that's bring your slides thing up. To brag about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank I you. would. I all would, of us. I would take all the credit. Right. You should take all the credit for that for your daughter's accomplishment. Okay. All right. It was. <laughs> yeah. Um, I unfortunately, um, it's not because of me. It's because of her. But uh, but she's got her own life, and and she's and she's living it, and it's great. So I'm going to bring myself down. I'll bring your slides up, and uh, you know the drill. I see them. So we're going to talk a little bit about girls and boys in STEM. Um, and your, I don't have control of these, right, Mitch? You have to do it. So just move forward. So the first thing I want to say is that whenever I talk about girls, I'm talking about everybody. You know, this quote is from the American Association of University Women. It says, and we improve educate when when we can't have excellence in edu education without equity in education. When we improve schools for girls, all students benefit. When we in and, and that's true of everything. So um, also keep in mind that when I talk about girls do this or girls are more likely to do that, I'm there's always an exception. Um, these are research based facts. This is in general. Uh, girls tend to do certain kinds of things, certain kinds of ways. Boys tend to do certain kinds of things, certain kinds of ways. There are always kids who are different, much to the surprise and delight of, of all. Um, so go ahead, Mitch. The, everything I talk about, too, is online. You don't have to take notes. Uh, SylviaMartinez.com is my website. There is, if you just do SylviaMartinez.com slash handout, you will find a handout with links to all the most important um, uh, research that I found about uh, girls in STEM. In particular, you could go to the link at the bottom, sylviamartinez.com slash STEM stash girls. I try to make it as easy as possible to get to these resources. And um, go for, take one more slide, Mitch. Because we don't have a lot of time today, um, I want to share kind of a snapshot of some of the things that are impacting the world, universities, and K-12 schools in regards to women in STEM. Um, you probably know this, but the statistics are good. I mean, this is kind of starting out with the bad news of the bad news, good news. We will get to the good news. The bad news is, is that women really haven't seen uh, employment growth in STEM jobs since the year 2000 and that they leave these jobs as, at a significantly higher rate than men and often say that there are gender issues involved. Not the headline-grabbing, overt discrimination, but small things, something that people are calling microaggressions. Um, every woman I know, myself included, has had a situation where they're made to feel out of place or not listened to. And it's, it's something like, you know, you're walking down the halls of the computer science department and someone says to you, are you lost? And, you know, the first time that happens, you might think they're nice, they're looking out for freshmen, you know, that's a nice thing. The second time, you wonder. The third time, you think, what's wrong? And the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh time, you think, there's something wrong with me. I obviously don't belong. Um, and if you whine about it, people say things like, oh, you know, they were just being helpful. It all seems so trivial until it piles up into evidence that women start to feel that they aren't being listened to and aren't valued in, in uh, careers, in college, and in K-12 education. Um, I've got tons of research that we're not, we're, we don't have to go over. Uh, if you are going to FETC and want to stop in on my session, I, uh, I'll talk more about this. But in general, women are actually making progress in some scientific areas, uh, going into biology, into uh, social sciences, into health sciences, into environmental sciences, are going up. The number of women going into engineering and computer science and physics, you know, it's sort of this like hard science, uh, not difficult, but, but more, you know, lab-based, somehow that's seen as 
uh, the, the uh, only a place for men. So um, this is discrimination is real in the world, and um, you know, we also know it's true in K twelve education. So Mitch, let's move forward. You know, we all know about the famous leaky pipeline, the leaky STEM pipeline. Kids start out completely enthusiastic about science. They love science. They love, you know, looking, playing with snails and, and, you know, figuring things out and testing hypothesis. And then as time goes on, school gradually convinces uh, the vast majority of kids that this isn't for them. That somehow they don't have a math brain or uh, the aptitude for science. And some of it breaks down on gender lines. Very often in middle school, girls get ill and other reasons that science just isn't for them. And, you know, I think this is a loss all around. We're losing a lot of kids, not just girls, who could be the ones that we need to come up with inventive solutions and out-of-the-box thinking, not the ones who can pass tests. And there's this conundrum where employers are saying, we don't want world but we don't want people who can simply, you know, uh, recite facts and, and pass tests. We want inventive, creative people. There's research that says that a diverse workforce greatly improves uh, creativity and, and the ability for teams to, to come up with solutions. And yet, school tends to treat kids who fall out of that very narrow definition of what success in, in science class is or math class and, and say, this isn't for you. So, you know, we've kind of got this double, ed, double, double, uh, you know, uh, uh, escalating a pipeline in K-12, dumping into a leaky bucket in college and careers, and we find out that, sure enough, women really aren't being um, taken seriously or going into STEM careers that where we could really use everybody's help. So go, go forward, Mitch. Um, you know, the question is, then what can schools do? If this is a global problem, it's cultural, it's economic, it's tradition, what can schools do? How does a third grade teacher fix the world? Well, I think that's exactly the kind of optimism that a lot of educators have, and that's a fantastic thing. We do think we can make the world a better place. We do think we can impact the next generation. And we have to know and we have to face these facts forthrightly. We can't say to kids, you can be anything you want to be and not also share with them that there is discrimination, that we can fix, that we by working together can make right. Um, and I think part of the part, part of facing that, so Mitch, go to the next slide. Now, tons of research on how girls and boys are different. Um, they tend to excel at, at different kinds of things. They tend to be aware of, of different kinds of things. And none of these tendencies are all good and all bad. You know, girls tend to excel at collaboration and language and tasks that have to do with consensus. Now, that can be a great thing when you're working on a team. And very often, science scientists do work with a, a, a big team. Um, but it can also create a, a procrastination. It can create a tendency to never really get to the answer, to always be looking for another answer. It can also mean that girls end up being the secretary or the, the documenter for a group and, and, the, and the boys are actually doing the work. Um, girls tend to be more aware of teachers' feelings. Um, they tend to be more aware of culture. They tend to be more aware of environment. Uh, this may be a good thing when you, you know, when paying attention is, is a good idea. It might be a bad thing if boys sort of soldier on with blinders on about how anyone else is, is feeling about them doing that. Um, girls also tend to be very attuned to teachers' feelings about the task at hand, meaning that if a teacher is communicating that the task is difficult, the girls will pick up on that more than the boys. Um, girls tend to be better at and interested in, in a wider range of subjects. Girls get better grades across the board where boys tend to sort of, you know, have that spiky uh, uh, perspective where they're very interested in one thing and everything else is like, yeah, whatever. Um, good and bad, right? You have a laser-like focus or you're a Renaissance person. It's not all one or the other. 
um, girls tend to not attract attention to themselves. Girls tend to avoid competition. Now, again, I know you all know, we all know, girls who are, you know, outright competitors will always go to the front of the line, will push their way past everything. But in general, if things are, if STEM is a competition, if the way that kids get to build robots is only through a, a contest, you will tend to have a gendered outcome by making that choice. Um, girls tend to be interested in science because they see it as a way to help people and, uh, and to do good in the world. And I think that we can, as educators, we could take these kinds of facets and say, how do we offer programs that, that don't discriminate to one kind of, of excellence? How can we pick up other kinds of excellence and tendencies and awarenesses uh, by looking at what we're doing and constantly questioning? Simply asking ourselves, just because we've always done something one way, is, is, is that really reaching everyone? And just because we have a few kids who are very successful doesn't prove that that's the, the, the best way to do it. We should always be looking for, you know, if you have robot competitions, how do kids get the same quality of, of um, science experience in a non-competitive way? And I think that there are lots of interesting new tools and technologies that gives us more potential than ever to answer that question. So let's move on, Mitch. I think there's there's one piece of there's one piece of research I want to share with you um, that is a really great study by uh, the Girl Scouts USA um, called Generation STEM: What Girls Say About Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And you know, you always say, if you really want to know what people think, you ask them. They went out and interviewed hundreds of thousands of girls about their feelings about STEM and school and life and careers. It's a fascinating study that's on, what, on the links that I shared with you. Um, just one little fact. Uh, when, when the interest in STEM is high, a lot of girls still don't consider it their number one career choice. Gender barriers persist, and girls say that they think that STEM isn't a typical career choice for girls. And say, almost 60% of them say that if they went into a STEM career, they'd have to work harder than a man to, to just be taken seriously. Now, I think that's very telling. I think what it says to us is that girls know. Girls know about all that stuff in the first slide that I showed you, that the world is a tough place that's not always fair, that we need to be honest with them and say, you know what, maybe it's not fair today, but this is how we fix it, by working hard and, and challenging those kinds of stereotypes. Not by saying, you know, oh, don't worry, everything is fine, you can be anything you want to be. Now, I'm not saying to crush kids' dreams, of course not, and certainly share this information in age-appropriate ways, but I think a lot of kids, especially as they get into the middle school age, are crusaders. They want to change the world. They're looking for challenges. They're, they're not looking for, you know, happy talk about what's in the future. Um, let's go to the next slide. And I think as a result of girls really understanding this, combined with the, with the reality that girls who have high math abilities are more likely than to also have high math abilities, to also have high verbal abilities, mean they're, meaning they're, they're good at lots of things, it gives them more choices. So why would you go into a career that you know you're going to be discriminated against? I think when we look at kids' choices, not as them misunderstanding the world, but as actually understanding a lot about the world, maybe this is a reasonable choice for girls. And we need to stop telling them that their insights aren't true. We need to enlist them in the effort to change and make things better. So next slide. So what are schools doing? And I think schools around the world are doing some excellent, excellent thing with girls in STEM. Um, there are a lot of programs that are focusing in on the kinds of things girls are interested in, ways to encourage them to stay in STEM programs, ways to make them aware of the, of the global uh, community of women that are working in, in STEM careers and connect them to people for, for mentoring and, and relationships and research internships. 
Um, I think that in K-12, um, there are actually about seven things that, that are happening right now. And I'd like to talk about uh, the first four. So, Mitch, next slide. I think there are, there are four things that schools tend to start out with when they say to themselves, let's get more girls interested in STEM. I think they talk about stereotypes. They work on themselves and they work with girls to kind of expose stereotypes for what they are, that there's no jobs that are only for boys and jobs that are only for girls. There's no such thing as a scientific mindset that you're born with that, you know, similar to growth mindset, anybody can learn these things um, and to find ways to interest girls in, in these subjects. I think a lot of schools explore relationship with role models. Um, making sure that the examples they use are non dirt that every scientist that they, they show or every movie they show or scientist they talk to is not a, the same white male. Um, I think they bring in real world problems and projects and connect that, that desire that, that all kids have, but especially girls to help others and see science as a way to improve the world. And also to think about the space. Look, looking on the walls, looking down the halls. What are, are we doing things that sort of communicate non-verbally that only certain kinds of students belong in this room? And how do we fix that? Those are things I think that schools are actually doing fairly well. There are three other things that I think that schools are a little more hesitant to take on. Um, so next slide. Um, and the first one of these is to address STEM teacher anxiety about STEM and teacher biases about gender. I think there's not enough done to really address um, teacher, especially math anxiety that can be transmitted to students and also to unconscious biases. Unconscious, they're imp how do you see your own unconscious bias? But it's been, the, the research is clear, teachers ask boys more questions, they let boys talk longer in class. Um, there's a whole host of things that people do just unconsciously, not thinking, oh, I'm going to encourage boys more than girls. That's not what happens. But, um, you know, I think it's very rare. And uh, obviously, if a teacher is overtly discriminating against anyone, that should be dealt with. That has, that's not something we need to talk about. That's a the, just an obvious thing that needs to happen. I think also, like I was saying, we need to tell the kids that this is a problem that they're going to be part of solving, that their generation is tasked with fixing this thing that's gone on for far too long. Um, and lastly, I think we need to change how STEM subjects are taught. I think we have a very narrow vision of what scientists do, of what mathematicians do, and the kind of science and math we teach tends to lead to that very narrow definition. Whereas in fact, and as Mitch said, I was a working engineer for a decade. There's very little I did that resembled the science and math that I got, that I was taught in school. And I think by expanding the way we teach STEM and the expanding the actual, the, both the what and the how of what we teach, I think we open up opportunities to more, for more kids to be successful in these in these um, STEM uh, career you know majors and careers, so um, Mitch, next slide. I'm going to take a, a little break now because I've been talking a lot, and the idea is for us all to be talking because I know you guys are doing things in your schools, and I would love to hear about them. So, Mitch, explain how this shindig thing works. Okay, let's shindig. So now, if you have a webcam and a microphone, uh, click on the avatar of another person with a webcam and microphone and just talk about this question with them. We're going to give you uh, about three or four minutes to do that. Um, one of you share what your school, what's the best thing that your school or organization has done to encourage all students to participate in STEM. And then, um, and then listen to the other person or the other, the other people in your group and what ideas can your group come come up with to build on that? And then hopefully some of you can volunteer to come up on stage. Now, if you don't have a webcam or a, um, again, move your cursor over your avatar and open up the IM window, and uh, and and answer this question through text and interact and.
uh, Sylvia will be mon monitoring that as well. So I'm going to pull myself down now. Uh, please, uh, please be very active. Just look. Just like you want your students to be active, click on another person's avatar and discuss this question. Okay, so um, just, you know, one thing I'll bring up that happened in my kids' school is they had a uh, year, uh, and I think it was around sixth grade, where every six weeks they... Um, they studied a different part of the world. And for that part of the world, at the end of it, they had to create um, you know, some artifact from that kind of the world, some uh, recipe book from that kind of the world, and a game based on that part of the world. And that seemed to ins inspire them. Uh, there were a lot of kids from, from, from that group who then, you know, you know, and weren't as intimidated by science and math as, as I've seen at other schools. I thought that was a really interesting thing to get kids collaborating um, in STEM-like activities. So what are some of the things that you've seen schools do? So is can people who were chatting like come up and share what they were chatting about? Yes, yes, yes. We can ask for some volunteers. Let's, let's volunteer some people. <laughs> can, I, can we just click on them? <laughs> it's like... Um, yeah, I can. <laughs> Uh, uh -huh. Okay, so let, let me see. It has to be somebody who I see has a... Um, now, somebody typed... Wait, wait. Somebody typed and then somebody created a girl's coding club. Who who said that? Who uh, raised your hand? Good. Be brave. Hold. <laughs> oh, uh, Angela. Angela. Find Angela. Okay. Yeah. Cheryl. Wait. Diana. Okay. So let me let me see if I can find Angela here. Uh, Angela. She's the green. She's green. Right. Well, I don't. I, oh, I, I, I. But I don't think that Angela. Yeah. If she doesn't have a um, camcorder, we can't really bring ah. her up. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, so Blaine. Oh, there she is. Oh, wait. Okay, okay so Angela. Okay, so Angela. I'll bring <laughs> Angela. You're, you're you're coming up. <laughs> I'm coming up. Oh my God. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> you're coming up. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so yes, I am, teach at Glasgow Middle School in Alexandria, Virginia. I'm passionate about STEM. Um, I believe that I'm a facts teacher. I'm a home ec teacher. And one of the things that I realized is I got better at my craft as a teacher is that I'm an engineer. I just happened to, I'm a textile engineer. And then I found out that that was actually a real engineering job. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, look, I could have been like a textile engineer. And nobody ever knew it. And my father was an engineer who worked for IBM. And my mother did a lot of things because we crafted like everything forever. And so I realized that one of the reasons I problem solved so well is because we crafted all the time. And you solve a problem through crafting and you know how to work it or you figure it out. And that's part of engineering. It's just knowing how to build things because I'm like I build a lot of stuff. And so I brought that into my classroom. And I know, um, like right now, we're doing e-textiles because that I want to because that puts basic electronics into textile, and then we're building um, a quiet book, and we're going to also put uh, e-textiles in it. And I'm super excited <laughs> about that whole process, and I'm tired because I work a lot. <laughs> But that's great. well. It looks like you're still at work. Uh, I am. <laughs> I am. I was grading. <laughs> so I didn't have my picture up because I was grading while I was listening to the conversation. <laughs> and then we outed you. So that here you are. But you know, I think that this is a really this is super important because you know coding. It, it, it computer science is one of the most skewed gender subjects in, in school, in, in college, and in careers. 
So by introducing girls to code, and you know, one of the great examples is Harvey Mudd College a couple of years ago said, what's with this? We have a female dean, we have a female head of computer science, you know, what is going on? And they really made a lot of efforts to try and, and improve that, and they have. And the, what, they, what they did was, was they changed their introductory computer class so it wasn't so dependent on uh, prior experience. So that, you know, when, when and, they, by, and they did that by bringing in things like um, textile design and, and speech encoding and media manipulation. And, you know, so it wasn't, it, so the kids who'd been, you know, uh, building their own games were suddenly back at square one, just like everyone else. So it created a level playing field. Now, you notice that the, this wasn't say, oh, we're going to create like, dumb classes for girls, oh, no. they made the introductory class different, right? So it's a, it's a very different thing. But bringing in these other on-ramps, these other avenues, I think are spectacular. Look at, so, so you've got the, the interactive, um, that's, well, you know, that lily pad. Yeah, so the kids watched a, a video, right, because I had to be out of the classroom. And so instead of like wasting the day with a sub, watching a video, doing nothing, I changed their summative. And so then they have to take one, they took notes, they have to take one aspect of their notes and then create um, a, a quiet book page and that teach that thing that they identified in their notes. And then part two is to go ahead and then put um, an LED on it somewhere, which is going to be super easy. So this is mine because I teach myself how to do stuff, right? And then I'm going to have, whoops, this is weird. You're going backwards. I don't do backwards well. But this is a washing machine. And so I'm going to have LEDs yeah. here so that you can turn it on. So, so the kids are doing lots of things cool. uh, um, like history and stuff. But they then translate with all their creativity. It's amazing, like stuff I would never think of. And that is the whole point about diversity. Like what they bring to the table is Terrific. fabulous, fabulous. Thank you for sharing, Angela. Um, Mitch, you have someone else who's going to come up? Thank you, Angela. Do um, you have some, uh, Cheryl? Hi, Cheryl. I'm not hearing Cheryl. Are other people hearing Cheryl? Cheryl, you're muted. You're push the mute Sorry. button. Good job. Yeah, it's it's okay right now. Okay, so yes. uh, I'm Cheryl from the southern part of the Philippines, and actually I'm from computer science department uh, at a university. So, <laughs> so I think last two years i wanted to um help our schools primarily um secondary schools and in introducing stem so this was part of my work as a master's degree student in south korea so when i actually came here schools are into stem i mean we didn't have that k-12 program and we don't have them then so like right now i'm going to schools and helping them like do stuff stuffs related related to STEM, so it's kind of difficult for me because we, the teachers have different mindset. Like it's very I think it's traditional uh, something like that. So I'm trying to introduce like different things to them. Like what are the things they can do to encourage kids to go to STEM? Because right now we really have few students going to STEM. Well, thank you. I'm I'm sure that your efforts are are going to pay off. Um, uh, thank and that's you, Philippines. That's fantastic. Um, I think that, and I think this is true around the world. I think people <laughs> want kids to be excited about science. They want to 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 you know them to to see the beauty and the joy in mathematics and be able to continue those, even if they don't get STEM jobs. You know, a lot of talk about good STEM jobs. Uh, that's not why I think we should teach all kids science and mathematics and engineering <laughs> and, 
and technology. I, I think we should we want to give kids the tools to to see the world as a place where they can make a difference. And for some kids, that's kind of a traditional science or computer science job. For other kids, it might be art, it might be medicine, but certainly the world, is, all of those, everything is being touched by technology. Yeah. I mean, some of the most fantastic advanced technology I see is in art and music. And we can't just say that, you know, kids are only got one kind of, of capability or one kind of career. Uh, I see this as a as a global mission, as as creating global citizens, and and it's it's you know a thing that that all kids can benefit from. So, Mitch, anybody uh, anybody else or thank you, Cheryl. Okay. So I was thinking, you know, <laughs> I'm looking at the time, and maybe we should move on to the slides. Okay. Okay. <laughs> let's uh let's jump back in. So if you go to the next slide, I just added a couple things because uh, again we're very short on time. I think there are so many things we need to talk about, but I think that this um, teacher math anxiety. Let's go back one. Um, this teacher math anxiety is something that schools aren't aren't taking seriously. So here's a little did you know. Did you know that education and elementary education majors specifically have some of the highest levels of math anxiety of any college major? So do people go, do people who are anxious about math become elementary education majors? Does elementary education make you anxious about math? I, I, I don't know. Um, but what we do know is that teacher math anxiety impacts student learning obviously in a negative way. And that not only that, is that female teachers math anxiety translates disproportionately to girls. So that girls who are more attuned to their teachers' feelings pick up this anxiousness about math more than boys do. Um, combine that with 90% of elementary teachers being female and we're kind of setting up a, a, a generational you know, cycle of people being afraid about math, being taught by people who are afraid about math. And, and you know, of course, we're going to have some kids who, who just never make it out of elementary school feeling confident in their own math abilities. I think that schools have to address this in a very specific way. So, so next slide. Um, there isn't actually a lot of research about this. I'm still looking. This is something I've been asking math experts. Um, if people tend to treat math anxiety as a personal problem. Here, read this book. And for example, Sheila Tobias is one of the top experts in math, but her work is primarily about you know, me overcoming my math anxiety. I think as a teacher, it has to be addressed on a professional level. Because not only do you have to uh, uh, you know, uncover the roots of your own math anxiety, you have to now figure out how to teach it to others. This is a professional development goal, not, not to be treated as a personal problem. And I think that, um, you know, the, the heart of math phobia, Sheila Tobias says, is a lack of confidence. That at some point in your math career, in your math journey, kids decide that they're not the expert on what they really know. That's, that, there's someone, that there's some trick they're missing, that there's some answer in the back of the book, whether it comes from a teacher or another kid or it's just some kids know them and some kids don't. And I'm one of the ones who, don't, who doesn't. It's, it's anti, um, you know, my, uh, it's anti my growth mindset. So this math anxiety in a teacher can't be overcome by saying, here, take this set of lessons and teach them because that actually undermines the teacher's anxiety. So I think in a lot of cases we're doing to help teachers te teach math and science better is, is kind of silently communicating to them that they don't really know what they're talking about. And as a result, we're making it worse. So this is something I think that, that schools need to address and, and help teachers overcome. It's certainly hard. Now, who's going to step up in a staff meeting and say, yeah, me, I don't like to do math, you know, and let's fix it. It, it. This is something that comes from a leadership position that has to be tackled seriously and coached um, just like anything else. So uh, uh, so next slide. I think the, 
the biggest thing that we're also not, not tackling in um, STEM, getting girls into STEM, is what science looks like. So, you know, does your science class look like this? And I'm not just talking about that there are a lot of girls here, but hands-on, they're doing things. Or next slide. Does it look like this? A lot of bored kids just making it. Some of them do it. Some of them make it through. You know, we get this little trick at the end and we congratulate, our, we congratulate ourselves that we haven't bored all of the kids to death. It's, you know, it's, it's not something we should be proud of. And I think that there are ways. And um, so next slide. One of the reasons that Gary Steger and I wrote the book Invent to Learn is to try and connect these dots to try and connect some of these things like the e-textiles and the programmable mini computers um, and how they can en enliven class. And by the way, uh, Cheryl, uh, Gary's going to be keynoting EduTech in Manila in March if you'd like to see him live and in person. Well, there's a little global connection. Um, and, and when we wrote this book, we really wanted to help teachers make the case for hands-on math and science in the classroom. And not just in the math and science classroom, but in every classroom. Because I think these principles really, really translate. So next slide. Some, some of the research that's on the website links that I showed you. Uh, this is a fantastic report from Intel called Make Hers, Make Hers, Make Hers, um, that talks about maker connected to computer science and engineering. And there's absolute facts. So if you need to take this to someone and say, yes, I can prove that making and hands-on science and technology really does uh, generate interest from girls, this is a fantastic research report to, to bring in there. Um, and then the things that you can do with these new technologies. So next slide. Everything from 3D printing and manufacturing, like this, this young woman made a cup for her grandfather who has Parkinson's. She designed it. You know, that's something that's not in a science curriculum. I guarantee you, because her grandfather isn't in the science book. This was a real problem that she had a passion to solve. And when girls and all kids see science as, as, as a place where they can be the main character in the story, I think it really changes things. Um, this was done with, with simple 3D manufacturing techniques, simple, simple CAD software that's completely appropriate for middle school to high school students. Um, so next slide. There's lots of opportunities for, for kids to be involved with things like enabling the future. This is a website that connects groups that have 3D printers with people who need prosthetic devices from hands to fingers to toes. And if you want a, a, a good cry, take a look at the unboxing videos of, of kids who, you know, have never been able to afford expensive prosthetic devices and can put on, you know, a cool hand for the, for the first time. This is really changing people's lives. Uh, with science, uh, next slide. And as Angela was talking about, there are new ways to get different kinds of kids. So not every experience with physical computing with robotics has to be about you know a robot competition uh, the top the, this top slide is a is a team of students that built um, a sign language reading glove with sensors in the in the, you know in the material that would read the hand positions connected to a computer that would then do text to speech the gown on uh, the dress on the left on the I'm not sure if it's your right or left um, it has uh, sensors and LEDs, so it responds. It's a it's a pollution sensing gown. This is chemical engineering. This is chemistry and and electronics. Things that kids should be exposed to. If we haven't the the physics curriculum, the biology curriculum, the chemistry curriculum, we are not giving these kids the future tools that they need. You know, last year's Nobel Prize in biology was bioinformatics. Computers are here. You know, they inform every job. Um, the ballet slippers track dance movements. And that, that round circle on the ankle strap, lily pad, it's a, it's a microcontroller. So the same microcontroller you can program to, to uh, program a robot with, you can also program to read sensors in the bottom of a ballet shoe. 
Now, you can obviously see that different kinds of kids are going to be interested in these different kinds of projects. But really, basically, you're learning the same kinds of things. How to program, how to troubleshoot, how to design, how to, you know, make something work in the real world, how sensors work, how to get input to and from digital devices into the analog world. Um, this is the Internet of Things that, you know, at the, the computer Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Everything is going to be that way. Our kids may never drive their own cars, but why not teach them that now they can, they can understand how those electronics work instead of it just being a magical box. Um, so next slide. And I think that, you know, this isn't just like, you know, after school fun time. The next generation science standards require that engineering principles are, are taught with the same emphasis as scientific principles. That means that the reliance on the scientific method, the seven steps, the hypothesis, the blah, blah, blah. Well, that's all fine and good when you're doing an experiment with one, one variable. But what about the rest of the world? What about invention? That's not how, typically how things work in the real world. You know, when I, I was an engineer, we wished we had a dependent variable. You know, I mean, everything was up for grabs. We didn't know anything was going to work. And a lot, a lot of stuff we tried had all components that had never been, had never worked before or worked together before. And you still had to make the final outcome happen. Um, I think that's that that end that kind of engineering mindset, this tinkering mindset, this we're going to figure out no matter what happens, no matter what it is, and that something may happen you completely don't expect. Like Angela said, the kids come up with stuff that you completely didn't expect, and that's a fantastic thing. So next slide. So. I'm back to the seven solutions. I think that schools are doing certain things well. I think um, that certainly there are bumps in the road in any of these things. I think that there are, is not one solution for, you know, you do this one thing and your girls will just flock to, to your science and engineering classes. Um, so we're about five minutes uh, from the end of the hour. I did want to kind of wrap up and show you some other opportunities. So, um, you know, it, Mitch, you want to skip ahead about four slides to the we've come a long way. Um, so in the next slide, you know, I think we've come a long way. We we definitely have made progress. There are lots of lots of things that are happening in schools that do not tell kids to not tell girls that their only role is you know to find a husband and get married and have babies. I think we've done a lot of that. There are professions, um, college enrollment across the board across all majors is over fifty percent women, and this is around the world, not just the United States. Um, in some professions, like doctors and lawyers, they're now seeing uh, women being in the majority in, in incoming classes. We're doing a lot of the right things. Um, so, Mitch, one more slide. I still think we have a long way to go. Next slide. You know, these were two covers of Girls Life and Boys Life a couple of months ago. You can still see we're communicating to girls that their value is in their hair and how they, and that they should wake up pretty and you know their first kiss and boys get to explore the future and that's not fair and we need to fix it but the most the most important ally in that battle to fix it are the kids themselves and um, with that I'd like to talk a little bit about a couple opportunities next slide uh, besides invent to learn uh, we are now publishing a number of books that explore these kinds of hands-on scientific opportunities. We have a new book called Making in the K-3 Classroom. If you are teaching in younger grades, this is a way to get STEM activities uh, into the hands of kids through Lego and electronic and, you know, really fun building materials. This is written by a teacher who's been doing this for 10 years. She's got everything laid out, connected to standards. It's absolutely fantastic. And a number of other books. Um, including a book by 
super awesome Sylvia, not me, 14-year-old YouTube star who uh, explains, and she wrote and illustrated this book to explain how to use the Arduino microcontroller to do a couple of science experiments. And slide. Besides FETC, uh, I'll be speaking at a number of conferences this up upcoming year. And in the summer, we're going to be holding a four-day summer institute. If you want to really have time, we do have speakers, but most of the time at Constructing Modern Knowledge is spent um, in, with teachers building projects so that they can have the luxury of time to really take off their teacher hat and think about what it feels like to learn with new materials. So uh, one more slide, it's my contact information. And then we have two minutes for um, any more discussion or questions if you'd like to. Uh, oops, where'd my computer go? There we go. If anybody would like to take the stage or ask a question in the I am, um, or Mitch, you can ask okay, a question. Okay, yes. Too. Well, no, I was going to say, um, yep, yeah, click on the raise hand button. You saw that it's actually fun to come up here and talk to Sylvia. So I'd like to ask somebody uh, to please click on the raise hand button. Uh, you know, I was, I was, I, I will say that I, be, be probably about before we started, I was, um, I was looking at Twitter and something came across that the number of women going into engineering um, has actually decreased over the last 20 years, that it was higher in 1985 as a percentage than it is today. It was like, wow, you know, how, how did that happen? I don't know if you saw that, yeah. that also. I didn't get a chance to read the article, yeah. but how is that? Because it, it just seems like everybody... There's a couple of theories. There, there's, a, there's actually a couple mm -hmm. of theories. I'm not sure if I... Well, here's the theory. Here, here's the theory. In the 70s, there was quite a push to uh, increase the number of women and minorities, and, and it worked. Um, I can tell you of you women who were in engineering uh, the school, by the time I left, it was about 30%. And over the next 10 years, it went up to about 50%. The theory is, is that when personal computers started really coming into homes, people bought them for their sons. And so there was a whole generation starting in the 80s of boys who had a lot of experience with computers, but not girls. So these boys signed up for computer science. These boys took the AP course. And by, you know, there, there are whole states where there is not one girl who takes the AP computer science test. Um, wow. it, it, it's, it's I, I, you know, I don't think they can exactly pinpoint that. But a lot of people think it had to do with the sort of, you know, com a computer is a boy toy. And a computer is, you mm -hmm. know, for, for computer games. And a lot of boys got into computer uh, science by being interested in games and then wanting to create their own games. And the tool was in their bedroom, so they used it. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. We, um, I, I guess one of the things that I remember was no, uh, going to a Going to a board of education meeting at our local school district when our kids were in school, which was in the probably in the 1990s, and you know, and bringing up the fact that we should be teaching coding, we shouldn't be teaching uh, PowerPoint every year. <laughs> you know, when, when somebody knew PowerPoint, they knew PowerPoint. It was okay. Let's let's go on to something that's more interesting, and being shot down by the superintendent who says, "No, we're academic subjects. That's just career oriented." That's not something that should be taught in schools. And it was like, what are you crazy? <laughs> um, you know, this is something that that that's beneficial to life. All well, kids should that, learn this. That's but. Why, but that's the same reason that engineering isn't a subject in high school. You know, the 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 eight old men they call them, the the people who decided what high school subjects should be, picked subjects that that were what they felt the proper entry requirements for Harvard, which at the time was like a divinity school. And so, you know, rich young men who are going to, to not have Greek, Latin, classical science, natural philosophy, you know, things like that is what science was called. And that's how we got our high school subjects. Everything else was considered mm -hmm. vocational. You didn't train to be 
uh, even a lawyer or a doctor. I mean, we don't have medicine. You know, we do health, right. but we don't really have like exploring your own body and exploring the world through through medicine. Um, there's a lot of things missing in the high school curriculum um, that is, you know, is set in stone. I think that the internet and the, you know, having kids be able to take online classes is, is an opportunity for us to say, not every kid has to sit, take the same biology, chemistry, physics. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think we have time for one last guest. And so I'm going to bring Angela back up. Hi, Angela. Hi, Angela. We know Hi, each other already. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't want to take up all the time, but I just do want to talk about number one, right? Home Ec is under CTE, right? Which is career and technical education. And so we're talking, we're talking about CTE without kind of saying that. And that's kind of an important thing that the CTE is kind of off on the side. But I teach cooking, which is chemistry. Right, and then I teach textiles, which is engineering. And then the other thing is I'm an FLL coach, which is for uh, robotics, and I do that after school, and I'm trying very, very hard to bring it during, uh, during the day class. So keep in mind, like the Hour of Code, the Girls Coding Club sponsored that for three years in a row now, and that's a nice after-school way to kind of bring this stuff into the school because you invite everybody to participate in one hour of code and then you celebrate that entire process and it's been really really good and we make it a whole week and not one day I, I think that's that's a that's a great thing I really appreciate you sharing that um, you know the the, the silos in high in, in secondary schools are very difficult to deal with, you know. And the biggest one is that but we're we're doing a disservice to the kids on the on the vocational side. But in another sense, we're doing a disservice to kids on the academic side. If ac if kids who are only taking academic classes never get to touch anything or make anything, we're not giving them the tools they need to be successful in life. Um, I think in the real world, all this stuff comes together. There's no one who doesn't use a computer in their job, from historian to artist to, you know, everyone. And, you know, we have to bring these things together. And I've been in very difficult meetings with, with school districts where we end up talking about, you know, uh, uh, job jobs and salary scales and, you know, qualifications and who can teach what. And, you know, those are tough conversations. This doesn't just you know, snap, snap, happen overnight, everybody gets a 3D printer, and the world is a better place. This is a constant um, conversation. We have to be brave, and we have to be up. And it comes from leadership, too. We can't expect every teacher to fight this battle on their own. We have to have leaders who are willing to have these conversations. So, uh, so this was oh, a great so conversation on. tonight. On yeah, you. thank you. And uh, well, actually, so I'll see you in about a week and a half in uh, in Florida, and also see you online in about a month when we talk about yes. the uh, the E in STEM and how it really can be integrated into virtually everything that you teach. So uh, thank you, Sylvia, and have a have a good evening. Sounds interesting. For well, thank you, yeah. Mitch. This was this was quite a shindig. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you came. I'm glad, and, I'm glad uh, you enjoyed geez, it. People are watching. <laughs> the people are watching. Feel free to contact me. Um, SylviaMartinez.com is my website. There's a contact form on there. I'm happy to answer questions. Talk about you know how what this will and um, you know see everybody in the in the future. Okay. Well, thank you. And this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm signing off for EdChat Interactive. We'll be making a an archive of this of the session tonight and posting it up on our website. And hope to see you all next week. And hope to see you all at FETC in about a week and a half. Uh, good night. <laughs>